Good morning. Today I'm here at the Homestead House. This is the house where the people who bought the property and actually built the home that we live in lived in this place before they built the home that we now live in. It actually was a hunter's cabin and I think they only stayed in here while they were working on the home. I don't think that they actually lived all year round in here. I can't even imagine what winter would be like in this cabin, but you can tell that the cabin is very old. I don't really know how old it is. I can look for, you know, evidence of it being old. I know that it was here before our time. I know it was here before the house was built. I kind of know the date in which the house was built so I can kind of go back in the records. I could go to the Klickitat County District's office and ask for the permits, the housing permits, and see when the house was built. But that would just tell me when that house was built. It wouldn't necessarily tell me how old this one was. So I have to kind of work with the information and the, the evidences that I have here now. This is kind of what it is like when we look back at creation. Man wasn't there, so all we can do is we can look for evidences. And one of the things we can do is ask, was there anybody there? And according to the Bible, God was there. So we can look at it from his perspective and see as well. So far in this course, we've been discussing how life came about at the very beginning. And we've looked at the belief that there was a creator, God, who actually created everything. And we've also looked at the other belief that there was no creator and life just popped into existence. And at this point, all we've done is we've referred to that as evolution. But we stopped talking about aliens because, well, uh, it doesn't answer the question of where did that first life form come from since if there was aliens they still ha they were life so we still have to figure out where they came from but the one thing we haven't really discussed is the different concepts in evolution and what we really mean when we say evolution there's really the three definitions for evolution and we've really only talked about one of them at this point I want to share these definitions with you from a guy named JP Moreland and he speaks it really well so I'm going to just quote to you what he actually says in order to summarize what the three different definitions of evolution are. He says the first is a change within limits. That's what evolution is. It, we call that microevolution, and everybody accepts that. Uh, the second is called the thesis of common descent, in which this is that all living things can trace their ancestral history back to an original organism or a small cluster of or original organisms. And the third definition is the blind watchmaker thesis, which is that all living things and their parts are the result of purely unguided forces that amount to a combination of natural law, pure random chance mutations, and the struggle for reproductive advantage. And so far in our class, we've only been d discussing the blind watchmaker when we talk about evolution. But as you can see, there's three different types of evolution, and we need to make sure that we understand that because as we talk about it, it can get really confusing if we don't realize that. Okay, so J.P. Moreland, he goes on to help us see that theistic evolution is different from intelligent design. So one of the things about evolution is there's something we that, they, that a lot of Christians believe in, and it's called theistic, which means that God is the one that carried out the evolution. He used evolution to create. Uh, and J.P. goes on to help us see that theistic evolution is different than intelli intelligent design. Um, intelligent design is what I've been proposing to you in the class. I've been saying, everything points towards a creator or a designer that's intelligent design it's being able to say that wow there's a brain back behind this all that is extremely brilliant to have been able to put all of this together so this is what jp Moreland says about theistic evolution being different than intelligent design he said theistic evolution affirms that the general theory of common descent and the blind matchmaker is true but god in some way or another guided the process as long as there's no way to detect that he did it if you're able to de detect God's activity scientifically, that would be the intelligent design view. The theistic evolutionist wants to make sure no theology or religion or any idea of God or any of that enters into the method of science. So when you talk about theistic evolution, that's what it is. It's saying God was involved, but we cannot prove that he was involved scientifically. Um, on the other hand, intelligent design is saying that there was a God, he was involved, and we can look scientifically and find evidence for him being involved. Today, what I want us to do is I just want to discuss the question, did God use evolution to create? Many Christians believe that he did. They believe that the six days of creation are long periods of time in which evolution was his method of creating. Christians who believe this believe in theistic evolution, and some also believe in intelligent design. You have people who believe this in both camps. There are Christians who believe in an old earth, and some who believe in a new earth. So you can see how complex this is, and the depths of the 
of the question that we're proposing, did God use evolution, goes really, really deep. Basically, there's this guy that I really think is a brilliant man. His name is Hugh Ross, and he expresses the view of the time frame of creation according to old earth Christians, um, and he does a very good job of it, okay? This is what he says. The length of the creation days, the biblical word for day is yom, and it has four different literal meanings. The first meaning is the daylight portion of a day, the second is part of the daylight hours, and the third is an ordinary day of like 24 hours. And the fourth is a longer but finite period of time. No other word in biblical Hebrew carries this meaning. Although many Christians argue that those days represent ordinary calendar days, the biblical text indicates that they lasted much longer. He says days one and three cannot be ordinary days as humanity defines them because the sun does not become visible until the fourth day. On the sixth day, Adam tends to the garden and names all the animals, undergoes divine surgery and marries Eve. That's a lot of material to have done in one day. The seventh day, in contrast to the first six, never closes with an evening and a morning. In fact, in Psalms 95 and Hebrews 4, it, they indicate that we still live in the seventh day. Hugh Ross goes on to say, The Bible never declares an age for the earth, but evidence derived from the text fits more comfortably with a date far older than a few thousand years. Reasons to Believe holds the position that the six days of creation represent long time periods and that creation accounts rec reconcile well with the scientific data for Earth's formation 4.6 billion years ago. Okay, so that is from Hugh Ross. Again, you can look it up. It's Reasons to Believe. And this is presenting why he believes what he does. Some scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament that are used to support this belief are in Psalm, found in, in two places specifically. There's others, but these are the ones that I think uh, you'll hear the most about. Psalms 94, it says, A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. So basically they're saying, look, from God's perspective, a thousand days, it's like it's like a day. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 8, which is the New Testament, goes on to say that again. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So Christians who believe this say that God wrote what he did to create from his perspective. Therefore, those days could very well be thousands of years, as these scriptures say. Even though these are brilliant people, I don't necessarily agree with everything that they say. So then that's old earth. So new earth people, people who believe Christians who believe in the new earth, they believe it for many different reasons as well. Since this is where I place myself, I'm going to share with you the reasons why I believe this. I'm going to read to you from a, a, a site called Answers in Genesis, and this is a man named Dr. Terry Mortensen. He's going to kind of explain to you what the New Earth people believe. So Young Earth is another way of saying New Earth. Young Earth creationists believe that the creation days of Genesis 1 were six literal 24-hour days, <clears throat> which occurred 6,000 to 12,000 years ago. They believe that about 2,300 to 3,300 years before Christ, the surface of the Earth was radically rearranged by Noah's flood. And all land animals and birds not in Noah's Ark, along with many sea creatures, perished, many of which were subsequently buried in the flood sediments. Therefore, creationists believe that the global catastrophic flood was responsible for most, but not all, of the rock layers and fossils. Some rock layers and possibly some fossils were deposited before the flood, while other layers and fossils were produced in post-diluvian localized catastrophic sedimentation events uh, or processes. Big words, point is, this is the view of the young earth creationists. I'm not going to overwhelm you with all the reasons why I believe in a new earth model of creation, but I want to get you to think with me on the possibility that this model is realistic and worth considering. I want you to consider whether God needed to use evolution to create. So let's look together. Did God need to use evolution to create? That's the question on the table. So let's begin first with how God said he created. Uh, he created by speaking into existence. So if we look at the words that he says, he says, by his spoken word, things were created according to Genesis. And God said, let there be, and there was. And God said, let there be, and there was. It's You see the spoken word and the, the fact that something pops into existence according to that spoken word. If you've studied evolution at all, you've heard about the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion is at that point in which in the fossil record, we just see all these organisms just come onto the scene all at once. Even though J.P. Moreland is an old earth Christian believer, he speaks into this in a way that I think makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, he says this, he says, in the Cambrian strata of rock, you have all the major phyla of organisms appearing abruptly. And in the fossil record earlier than that, you find nothing 
that's leading up to it. It's called the Big Bang of biology. It's as though God said, let there be, and then all of these life forms just suddenly appeared. I, I think that's really cool because it's actually an old earth person saying, yeah, this is like, it happened when God spoke it into existence. So even though he's an old earth rather than a young earth believer, I feel in this statement, he gives me more reason to believe in a young earth rather than an old earth. My second reason why I believe this way, uh, we've discussed that scripture says morning and evening the first day, and I believe God took the time to say morning and evening because he was making sure we understood he was giving us his account from our perspective. So we would understand morning and evening would be a perspective that we would understand as being 24 hours. So why would God say morning and evening unless it was a 24 hour period? He wouldn't say, and it was morning, 1,000 years later and now it was evening. So that's another reason why I believe in this 24-hour period. When God created, He creates with appearance of age. This is a big one. This is the one that I have to say is the reason why I st stand solidly on the reality that I do not believe that God needed to use evolution to create. You can see the appearance of age in all of Scripture. If we go to the very beginning of the book, when we see God first creating, we see Him do this with, when He creates Adam. He formed him from the dirt and the dust. He did not create an egg, fertilize it, and wait for it to develop into a baby. Adam would have been, had the appearance of age. He would have looked to have been about 25 years old or whatever. You know, I mean, he wasn't a baby. And Eve as well. In fact, we see that, they, that Adam and Eve get married. Uh, that's kind of a, something that adults do, not, not, not a baby. God also created trees and other plants, but I want us to just think about trees for a second. He did not create a pine cone. He actually created the tree. If you had been a scientist walking around at that time and you'd walked up and cut down that tree, you could count the rings and you'd say, oh, this, this tree is like 150 years old because I counted the rings. And you would be right. You're doing science correctly in the sense that that is exactly how we determine how old that tree should have been. However, the fact that God just spoke it into existence means that it was only a day old, even though it had the appearance of being 150 years old. So God created the animals as well. Same argument here, the, the, and we've talked about this before, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, he created the chicken. He spoke it into existence. So here's my next thought on this appearance of age. And, and this goes deep. I think about Jesus. Jesus is God. He claimed to be God. All right. So he is either who he claimed to be and he really is God, which means I should be able to see how he creates and then understand how God creates because he is God. Or he isn't God and he's crazy for thinking he is, or he lied to us. And the reality I come up with in my brain is he has to be who he claimed to be. There's no way he could have been lying and he's definitely not crazy. So therefore, if he says he is God, then he is God. And I should be able to look at how he created and tell how God created. In case you're wondering, where is it that Jesus claims to be God? In John 8, 58 through 59, it says, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, I am is a name for God, and he basically is saying, look, I, I am God, and I was there when Ab before Abraham was. Uh, this was big. The people that were listening to Jesus talk at the time, they knew exactly what he just did. And they, it says, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Do you know why they were going to stone him? They were going to stone him for what's called blasphemy. When you claimed to be God and you were not, it meant death. They, they had the right to kill you. The interesting thing is here, Jesus is God. It's not blasphemy. Luke 22, 70 through 71 says, and they all said, are you the son of God then? And he said to them, yes, I am. He uses the same name again, I am, that name for God. And then they said, what further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And basically what they're saying is, hey, the guy needs to die. He claims to be God. See, he even claimed it again. We just heard it again. He thinks he's God. So if Jesus is God, I mean, he says he was, then we should be able to see how Jesus created and learn about how God can create. Okay, so let's check out some of the miracles Jesus did to learn how God creates and what limitations he is under, if any. The first miracle I think of is the first miracle in the Bible that we read about, and that is water into wine, right? When Jesus actually performed that miracle, he took regular water and turned it into the finest of wine. Wine that is fine is an aged wine. So it had an appearance of age. Another one is feeding of the 5,000. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he took loaves and fishes, and he prayed and fed 5,000 people off of two loaves and three fishes. If you'd have looked at that fish and somebody would have asked you, how old is the fish you're eating? You would have said, I don't know. It looks like it's probably about four or five years old. You, you just watched it come to, into being. Jesus had two loaves and three fishes. There's no way those three fishes 
or was it three loaves and two fishes? I don't remember. Anyways, point is the number of fish did not, you can't feed 5,000 people off of two or three fishes. You needed to have a lot more than that. So everything you created, the bread that was created on the spot when he fed those people and the fish that satisfied everybody so that there were baskets left over were created on the spot with the appearance of age. Raising from the dead, he took people who had died and three, think of Lazarus, three days in the tomb and he brings them back to life. He has that power to bring back to life that which was dead for three days. This is a powerful God. Uh, healing the paralytic, you know, a paralyzed man where the nerves and, and the spinal cord does not work anymore and Jesus comes, touches him, brings him up and all of a sudden these things are healed perfectly and he is able to walk. Restoring a shriveled arm, a shriveled arm, the, the young man probably had an arm, if you've ever seen someone like this, where it stops growing when they're young as a child and is a tiny little shriveled up arm and Jesus heals it. He makes it large again. He makes it the same size as his other hand. Okay, giving it the appearance that this hand has grown alongside of this hand for the entire life of the man, and yet it was just brought to be. Taking his own body and somehow, beyond anything that we can understand, raising from the dead himself. All these miracles show that we have a very powerful God. He, he doesn't need millions of years to create. It's not as though he needs that. So what I really want to do is I want you guys to just stop and ask the question, is God powerful enough to not need evolution? Is he subject to the same laws of physics as we are? Or does he have power over all of these laws? God can and does have power over all the, the laws of nature. We see this in Abraham in the burning bush. We see the 10 plagues of Egypt. Uh, we see it in the crossing of the Red Sea. This is a God that can do whatever he wants in his creation even going into miracle status. We see as Jesus walking on water. We see him reattaching a cut off ear. This is a God who is powerful enough to step into his creation and yet not be subject to the same laws of physics that we ourselves are. His own resurrection from the dead and the ability that he had after he rose to actually walk through a wall, those are all evidence that he has power that goes beyond being limited to the box of creation as we are. So if God is powerful enough to do all these things in real time by speaking into existence by his word alone, then I think he didn't need to have evolution to create. Here's another thing that's interesting to me, and that is, this is one that my husband brings up a lot. He says, well, if it was millions of years, what do we do with death? You see, death is a problem to a long stage of time because according to the Bible, death was a result of Adam and Eve's sin. So before that, death was not part of creation. If it was long periods of time, then animals would have been dying before the fall of man when the curse about death comes into play. Genetic mutations would have then also been present before the fall. And I have a hard time with that because God said every, after every day of creation, he says, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was very good. In Romans 5:12, it says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all sinned. You see, death comes in because of sin. It's not until the fall of mankind that we see it coming into the picture, or mutations for that matter. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22 says, For as by a man came death, and by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So here's the thing, as you consider what you believe and why, you're forming a foundation to your faith. What will you hang your faith on? It's important to answer the question of what I believe and why I believe what I believe. In this lesson, I have actually showed you how to do that. How to answer the question, what I believe and why. And I've also showed you what some other people believe that are different than me. You may be in different places. You may agree with what the evolutionists believe. You may believe in what the theistic evolutionists believe. You may be an old earth and new earth. Here's the thing. I want you to be able to express why you believe what you believe and I want you to have a reason for it. Why do you believe what you believe? I never want you to answer the question of what you believe with the answer, well, I believe because somebody told me to believe that way. I want you to believe because you've taken the time to really consider what truth is. I want you to form your own foundation of belief based on solid truth. Jesus says in his word, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus, again, the one that is God, has said, hey, I am the truth. And I want you to consider that. If he is the truth, then we can go to him 
to find the truth. So we should be able to search the scriptures, which are God's word, and find truth. And as you form what you believe, practice sharing what you believe with others. Don't be afraid of hard questions people may ask you about your faith. It's okay to answer, I don't know, but I will find the answer out. And then go look and pray and try to figure out what the answer is that somebody asked you about what you believe. We are not supposed to know everything. And all of us are fallible human beings, which means all of us have some things that we probably aren't right about, correct? We're not God. We're not all-knowing, but He is. So we can go to the God who is all-knowing and ask for His help to understand these things. He may not give you all the answers right away, but that's all right. I can still trust Him in, with the things that I do not completely understand and know. Questions should do two things. First and foremost, they should cause you to go to God in prayer, asking Him to reveal His truth to you. Second, they should cause you to seek answers. As you do these two things, you will find that your faith will either be strengthened in the truth or God will help guide you toward the truth if your beliefs are off in some area. Seeking the answers without prayer will take you down roads that are not necessarily true and deception is likely to follow. So be sure to pray first to, to, God, to the God who promises He'll do what you ask Him, especially if your request is to have the knowledge to know Him better and to know His truth more accurately. I want to leave you with some scripture here, uh, John 6, 6 through 14. This is Jesus talking, and this is, he says, Jesus answers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. He says, look at the way I create. Look at the things that I do. Look at my miracles to see that I really am who I claim to be. There is nobody who could do the things I've done except for God. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidences of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And then he says this, And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So if you want to understand who God is, you want to understand, is there really a God? Did He create? Did He need evolution to create? Pray. Ask Him to show you. He will. That's exactly what He wants. He wants you to know Him. So as we continue with this class, I'm just praying that you will continue to see God and learn how great and mighty is our God.